You're listening to the Sports Circus, and I'm Mike Golick. Welcome to the Sports Circus. I'm your ringmaster, Sal, live from Las Vegas in the Amp TV studio, AAMP.TV. Today's show is brought to you by UppercutChops.com. Check out their tasty selection of all-natural, dry-aged, USDA prime Wagyu steaks and chops. Wait till you taste their best-in-class New York steaks, the filet mignon, of course, the king of all, those gigantic cowboy cut and tomahawk cut ribeyes, best I've ever seen, best you probably ever have. Check them out at UppercutChops.com. That's UppercutChops.com. Or give them a call, find out what's for dinner, 702-799-9935, 702-799-9935. Again, 702-799-9935 for UppercutChops.com. Yes! (laughs) Can't beat those. Boy, those steaks are incredible. All right, a big welcome in everybody listening in on our CBS, NBC, and Fox Sports affiliates from coast to coast, all of our independents as well. Everybody also watching on Cox, Comcast, Spectrum, Frontier, Time Warner, and WOW Cable Television. Thanks for joining us as well as Hotel TV in over a half a million rooms from coast to coast. Joined by a couple of very special guests, one we've had on before and then one we have not had on. In fact, first, Zach, we'll let you go ahead and tell everybody about yourself in 30 seconds, and then you can introduce our next guest. Well, I'll tell you, there's not a whole lot to tell about myself other than I've been around the game quite a few years now. I started as a teenager uh, in Ogden, Utah with Tommy Lasorda running his clubhouse. Um, Got a lot of experience at that. Uh, I later became the equipment manager for the Texas Rangers for a couple decades. So it it morphed into a into a major league job. Uh, One of the guys that was probably most responsible for that happening is the guest that you have on the show other than myself today. Uh, In addition to him being responsible for me uh, and my career as a as a clubhouse guy, uh, he played on the 1968 Ogden team that I wrote about in my recent book, Lasorda University. Uh, and I'll I'll say no more, but introduce the guest as Bobby Valentine. All right. And that would be Bobby Valentine. You've probably seen him as a player. You've seen him as a manager. The guy's been around. He knows how to win. And he just got a big smile. He's lighting up the stage. And, Bobby, thanks for joining us today. Uh, hey, great to be with you, and in particular with Zach. As Zach mentioned, 1968, all right, that, that's like a, a thousand years ago. We were together when he was a 17-year-old, maybe 16-year-old kid, and I was an 18-year-old kid. I had just signed out of high school. I'd travel, get on a plane. i go to Ogden, Utah, and who's there to greet me but Tommy Lasorda and Zach Manassian, and, and there is a friendship with Tommy until the day that he died, and there's a friendship with Zach, and I, I hope until I go first. Uh, we, we've been together in this thing a long time. Wow. How many years? Since 1960? That's what, 56 55. years? 55. 50, yeah. yeah. 50. Wow. We met, in, uh, we met in June of 68, so we're going on, I guess that'd be 55 years that's this a, June. <laughs> that's a long time. That's a long yeah. time. It's, well, a lot of things happened during that time, but when you, when you first met... What did it seem like from the clubhouse to the field? What was the relationship when you first started? Obviously, it was a worky one, but how did you develop that over time? Is just trust over time? How did that carry on over the years? A working one? What are you kidding? He ran the clubhouse. That means he charges 25 cents for five-cent Cokes. That mm-hmm. means he, he made sure that our uniforms were in our locker all the time, made sure that the hotel rooms were ready when we were on the road, made sure that the buses were there 
in time after the game to take us wherever we were going. And he was in charge of making sure that he and Tommy Lasorda got the free meal when we were on the road stopping at these truck stops. So that was the relationship we had. He was taking my money and he was making sure the manager and he ate free while I was paying for it. Hey, that sounds like what the Oakland A's do, right? Charging <laughs> 25 cents for a five cent Coke. I don't know. It's, it sure seems that way anyway. I don't know. But that was back in the day. But you did a lot, Zach, and you were really involved on a day-to-day -day basis with a lot more than what people even realize that you could do or what you would do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, well, it, it was, you know, that was the lowest of the low, the rookie league. You you couldn't go any lower. And as Bobby mentioned, it was really guys that had just signed out of high school. Uh, for him, high school probably ended right there around the 1st of June. And by June 20th, he found himself in Ogden playing professional baseball. And the same was with all the other guys. So uh, at that level, Tommy really had no help. We had no coaches, no trainer, um, really no what help at all. We had you were the trainer. Well, well, you, you were the traveling secretary. Yeah. You, were, you were everything. You wore all the hat. Well, I did that. I will say I did that. I wasn't much of a trainer, Sal. Uh, <laughs> I, I, my training was very limited, uh, but I knew how to go out and buy band aids at the local uh, pharmacy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, you know, but I did do a lot. I had a lot of, for a 16 year old, I had a lot of responsibility. And as Bobby, will tell you, the last thing you wanted to do was disappoint Tommy. And so when he told me to do something, I tried to be sure it was done uh, properly and in a timely manner. And so it, it taught me a lot about baseball, taught me a lot about life. Uh, gave me a lot of uh, responsibility uh, for those three months uh, in Ogden. Now, the one thing I will say is by 68, I was a three-year veteran. I had come in 66. I had worked in 67. And so this was my third team in Ogden. And by then I had a lot under my belt. So I was, you know, I was pretty savvy as to, as to what was going on, in particular getting those free meals. I was by by 68. I was a professional at getting two free meals, one for the manager and one for myself. And usually, Sal, uh, as you announced in the in the opening of this show, it wasn't the steakhouse you were talking about. But we did try <laughs> to eat steak. So uh, while the players were eating burgers. So it was a lot of fun. We had a great time uh, in, in response to your question. Uh, we just, you know, we hit it off uh, right from when we met. I mean, it was just, you know, I felt like uh, I knew him all my life and I didn't, it wasn't like uh, we just met in Ogden. So, and it's been obviously a relationship that has uh, flourished over the years. Uh, we had some great guys on the team, uh, Billy Buck, rest his soul, uh, Steve Garvey, uh, just some great guys. So, so it, it made it all fun. You know, it, it's amazing, Sal, when, when you think about what he's saying. And I just want to give a little color. Getting those things. We would be in Patello, Idaho. And the game would end. And we'd get on the bus, often in our uniform, because the clubhouse didn't have running water. And we would travel another five or six hours to the next place we were going. We were never in Patello. We were in Idaho Falls. We were in Magic Valley. We were in uh, Caldwell. We were in Salt Lake. Uh, but the game would end, and we would get on the highway. And now the only thing that was open at night, because we're traveling through the night, are these truck stops. So the bus would pull into the truck stop. The starving players would have to stay on the bus. Zach would go in to talk to the manager of the truck stop. And wh how would that go, Zach? Well, sometimes it was good. Sometimes it went well and it was easy. And other times they said, oh, we can't handle it. And that was the bad news. I had to go out and give the thumbs down to, to Tommy and to the rest of the guys. And all that meant was I was going to get back on the bus and we were going to drive another hour to the next to the next truck stop. So 
Uh, we did that drill over and over, and as I said, I did it for three years. So by 68, I was pretty good at, uh, at squeezing the guy for a couple meals. So it was, it was good. And the thumbs down was that the guy isn't going to give Zach and Tommy a free steak to serve these 24 starving kids. So we get back on the bus, and he'd get on the, uh, on the bus and said, Sorry, guys, the kitchen's closed. And we'd all <laughs> moan and groan. And we'd be back. We'd be back on the bus. But that was spectacular. When he says he was a three year veteran, I was I was wet behind the ears. You know, I landed at at uh, the Salt Lake Airport. We had a drive to Ogden. Tommy was driving. And uh, I said, you know, Tommy, you know, I'm the number one draft choice. Anything you need me to do, you just let me know and I'll try to lead the team. And he said, well, since you are the number one guy, I'm going to let you buy me the first steak dinner of any of the guys. And then I'll let you know when it's your turn again. So it was all about eating. It was all about playing. It was all about learning and having fun. And uh, Zach Book, Lasorda University, uh, tells the stories from the voices of all my teammates from 1968 that he researched found them how the heck he found them i'll never know a lot of these guys just played that particular three-month season in their professional career and then they didn't get invited back and uh, still had wonderful memories 50 something years later of um, the education they got while they were in ogden Okay, folks, we're going to be back here with Bobby Valentine and Zach Manassian in just a few minutes. Great stories. Don't go anywhere. Last one to come here on the Sports Circus. Back in a few. I'm your ringmaster cell of the Sports Circus, a primetime nationally syndicated television, radio, sports, and entertainment show. The Sports Circus covers topics others are too scared to talk about. There's no other primetime show like it on here that'll punch you in the face and you'll beg for more. Join me, Hall of Famers, World Champions, and All-Star Celebrity Guests for Chaos and Controversy here on Lipson and all podcast platforms, plus thesportscircus.com. Remember, folks, it's a circus and we prove it every day. Do you know someone with a drug or alcohol problem? Get help right now. Insurance may cover everything. Stop the drug and alcohol nightmare. Are drug and alcohol problems hitting you too close to home? Get help right now. Insurance may cover everything. 800-831-1560. 800-831-1560. 800-831-1560. That's 800-831-1560. Do you own a timeshare? Well, face the facts. You made a mistake. You made a bad purchase. A timeshare is not an investment. It's a money pit that continues forever. If you use your timeshare, that's great. But if you don't and you want to legally get out of your contract, call my friends right now at the Timeshare Exit Hotline. They're an experienced team of lawyers who help good people like you get out of a timeshare contract that they just don't want. Don't throw away your money on maintenance fees. Use it for things you really want. We can help you end your timeshare contract and stop the money drain immediately. If you're ready to move on with your timeshare, call our team right now. Cancel your timeshare now with a free call. 800-298-3173. 800-298-3173. 800-298-3173. That's 800-298-3173. Can your IRA stand up to the next financial crisis that our top economists are saying is at our doorsteps? By allocating a percentage of your IRA into physical gold and silver with a tax-free rollover, you can diversify and safeguard your holdings from turbulent markets and economic downturns by putting your IRA back on the gold standard. Find out how to safeguard your assets with a tax-free rollover with a Genesis Gold IRA, the only IRA that can hold physical precious metals. 
Call now for your free gold and silver report. Protect your IRA today with one simple phone call and learn how to qualify for up to $10,000 in free silver. Call Genesis Gold Group, empowering faith-driven stewardship. 800-932-5517. 800-932-5517. 800-932-5517. That's 800-932-5517. Welcome back to the Sports Circus. I'm Roy Firestow. Now it's time to throw it back to Sal. Oh, hey, Sal. How are you? Great to be. Great to be back, Sal. Thanks for having me back. Uh, I know we talked last week a little bit about Lasorda University, but uh, I think it's a terrific book. Uh, I think it's a feel-good story that uh, men, women, kids all have seemed to enjoy. The ones that have read it talks about a young Tommy Lasorda, not the famous Tommy Lasorda, but a young manager that was trying to get to the big leagues just like the players he was managing. Uh, One of those players who at the time was a terrific athlete, tremendous football player, recruited by a couple hundred major colleges around the country. Uh, In fact, USC wanted him to replace a guy named O.J. Simpson in the backfield. So uh, that'll tell you something about his football talents. Uh, But his baseball skills were off the charts. Uh, He came into Ogden as a confident young guy of 18 years old, and he had a bright, bright future ahead of him. Uh, And I think probably... The luckiest part to him signing that year was that he got to play under Tommy Lasorda. But I'll let you tell. I'll let uh, I'll let Bobby tell you, the, the, your listeners a little bit about that, and maybe talk a little bit about what his Ogden experiences were. Um, I know in the book uh, I have interviewed, oh, I think twenty one, twenty two of the people that were there that summer, and they all had great things to say about Ogden and Tommy, but I'll let you uh, get Bobby's take on all that. Bobby, take it over. <laughs> You're the best, Zach. Yeah, 1968, you know, it was a, it was a different world, and, and we got to live in it together, Zach, with, with the greatest mentor of all time, Tommy Lasorda. Understand, just put some things into perspective. Meal money in those days was $3 a day. Uh, the hotel room was three dollars a day so you had to have a roommate and i had a roommate named tom pachorik who's still one of our good friends uh, to this day and we split a buck fifty each per day that we were at the hotel then zach and tommy worked out a deal with the manager to let us put our stuff in tommy's room so our suitcases got packed we put this our extra stuff in tommy's room checked out of our room and we left so we didn't have to pay for those days that we were on the road. Uh, when Zach mentioned meals, you know, one of the, our favorite places was chuck a It was an all-you-can-eat place for a buck 99, or was it 99, Zach? N- I think it's 99 cents. Now, we, we, we just, <laughs> just to interject quickly here, we went back to Ogden last January. I did a, I did a presentation at Weber State, and when we got to town, we said, Let's drive around town, check out Ogden, and see how much it's changed. But I'll bet you one thing hasn't changed. I bet Chuck O'Rama is still here. So we went to Chuck O'Rama and we found it, and God knows it was there. Brought back a lot of great memories. The downside to the whole thing was dinner was now fourteen ninety nine. So it went from ninety nine to fourteen ninety nine. 55 years later, but it still stood. So, but we would, we would go through there in a line and Tommy would be at the head of the line and Tommy Pachorik would be right behind him. And Tommy have a carrot hanging out of his mouth and his plate in his hands and loading that baby up. And we'd go down the line, look like a mountain on his plate. And, you know, Wimpy would say, Tommy, 
It's a buffet. It's all you can eat. We can come back and get however much more we want. And Tommy would say, I oh, don't worry about it. I'm worried they're going to run out of food. So, <laughs> so, so he, w- he would load that plate up, and we would do the same thing. We followed him like he was the Pied Piper. Whatever he said, whatever he, he wanted us to do, we listened, and we did it. And that was the way that it all went. And one more little thing we found out when we went back there. We decided, asked where a nice place for lunch would be. And they directed us down by the stockyards, by the railroad stockyard. Well, interestingly enough, we went to the stockyards, which was on the other side of Washington. It was a Washington Boulevard? Yeah, Washington. Right. On the other side of Washington Boulevard to have lunch. Well, the interesting thing is we weren't allowed on the other side of Washington Boulevard. Tommy made it a strict rule. You can't go to the other side of Washington Boulevard. And who the hell were we to ever question Tommy's rules? Because if you got caught breaking one of Tommy's rules, it wasn't a good thing. As a matter of fact, you could get sent home. And uh, I think one of our guys did that year. But anyway, we went to the other side. We found a place for lunch. It was an old couple hundred year old uh, area of town that was all renovated, a nice hamburger joint. The guy came over to serve us and we said, hey, what was this before it was a hamburger joint? And he said, oh, you don't know where you are? He said, no. Where? We said, where are we? He says, this is the old red light district. This was a brothel for many decades. The guys would come off the train, the workers, and they'd have a dinner and whatever else they wanted to have for that night before they got back on the road. But we never got to go there, which is interesting that Tommy said no crossing the line. Now, sometimes we wonder, is that because Tommy was there and he didn't want to see us to see him there? We don't know. We're not going to go there. <laughs> That's great stuff. I the mean, other crazy look, thing. These story, look, the, the stories are one of the reasons that I really do this program. It is a long-running show. And Bobby, it's the first time you've been on here. I've been at this here for eight years and it just kind of happened, whatever. But I like it because the format, there is none. The stories, who the hell knows what's gonna happen? And it's stories like this that people tune and say, you know what, I don't get this anywhere else. By the way, a big welcome back to everybody listening in, of course, on our CBS, NBC, and Fox Sports affiliates from Honolulu all the way across down to South Florida and a whole bunch of other points in between. And thanks for joining us on television as well on Cox Comcast Spectrum, Frontier, Time Warner, and Wow Cable TV and Hotel TV in all Nielsen rated markets. That's 210 of those. Right, that's great stuff. All right, so here with Bobby Valentine and Zach Manassian, there's a book that Zach had written. It is called Lasorda University. And folks, in case you haven't seen it, go to the sportscircus.com and go to the partners page and you'll see that book right there. It, it's uh, hold up a picture of that book. Let's see what that book looks like, guys. All right, for everybody watching on TV, there it is with the blue hat. Of course, it's a blue Dodger blue hat, and that is the Lasorda University hat. And I'm waiting for one of those hats. One of these days, I'll get one, if not a T-shirt. I don't know. We'll have to see if, <laughs> if uh, the powers that be would send one to me. But at the end I of the day, folks, work, this, I think we can work it out. You we know what? <laughs> is that right, Zach? We what can you work do? it out. That sounds like a song. That's nice, Zach. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Is that right? Right. Hey, Sal, yeah. hey, Sal, you know, if, if Lasorda was to meet you, you know what he would say in, in, with his initial handshake, right? I don't. He would say, hey, Sal, remember one thing. I don't like you because you're Italian. I like you because I'm Italian. <laughs> and I, I want to tell you that I heard him say that a thousand times to a thousand different Italians. And... Um, uh, they all put they put everyone in a happy place. Oh, my God. That's funny. I, I'm going to remember. I'll use it, but I'm going to credit Tommy for that one. A lot of, a lot of the boys from back home, I'll certainly use that one. <laughs> you know, a lot, of, a lot of stories, Sal, as you mentioned, but one that keeps popping into my head because we were talking about uh, uh, the conditions in Ogden. The ballpark was a terrible park, but we loved it. It was our home. The hotel was a big old brick building, but we loved it because it was our home. Uh, But there were some, you know, some things about it that were tough. And one story that comes to mind is before the season started, we had a little bit of about a 10 day 
workout period there where Tommy would watch the guys work out and then he released some guys and so on and so forth. Anyway, that day, one of the players who ultimately got released came to Tommy and said, Tommy, uh, my ankle's a little sore. Where's the whirlpool? And Tommy <laughs> said, excuse me? And he said, where's the whirlpool? I got a bad ankle. Tommy said, follow me. So this player followed Tommy into the back who took him into the latrine and kicked open the the toilet door and looked at the toilet and put his foot up and flushed it and said, there's the whirlpool. Stick your foot in there and flush it again. So things were <laughs> rough in Ogden back then, Sal. And, and uh, that, <laughs> yeah. that was the Tommy. whirlpool. And, and get it, Sal, two shower heads. Yeah. Two shower heads with hot water on a sporadic basis. Yeah, right. Yeah. Sometimes you got it and sometimes you didn't. Right. Again, this yeah. these sounds like the conditions at the Oakland Alameda Coliseum. I mean, am I wrong about this? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We we got one minute left in this segment here, guys. That's great stuff. You see, these players today have no damn clue what really roughing it means. Right? Oh, you can't no. go no. you can't go to a four How about or the minor five star players? hotel. They play now six days in a row, Sal, in the same place. And they have every Monday off. My minor league career had no days off, all right? And we played three days stands. So after three days, you had to travel and go somewhere else and play the next day. Yeah. You really know, different. These, yeah, these, these kids today have no day. And then they're paid a lot more, of course, than teams were paid back then. Tell you what, guys, we're going to go to break here in a, just about 30 seconds. But when we come back, maybe, Bobby, you could... Bring us back from break and tell a little bit more about your position of what? Of the book. What your thoughts are, where it's strong, where it's stronger. And some of your greatest stories and moments as well. Back here in a few minutes on the Sports Circus with Bobby Valentine and Zach Manassian in just a few moments. Folks, you don't want to miss this. Lots of fun here. Don't go anywhere. If you served in the Marine Corps, by now you know about the contaminated water problem at Camp Lejeune. If you were stationed or worked at Camp Lejeune from 1953 to 1987, you probably have a lot of questions. We have some answers. You could be entitled to compensation. Billions of dollars are being allocated to pay for damages to anyone stationed at Camp Lejeune during that time. Unfortunately, it appears that officials may have known the contaminated water problem existed and did little to protect their men. The Semper Fi Code was not honored. If you or someone in your family has developed a serious illness, including various forms of cancer, call this Camp Lejeune legal support line right now. You can't turn back the clock and change what happened, but you can certainly call right now and learn your rights as a Marine. Here's the number. Call 800-335-7196. 800-335-7196. That's 800-335-7196. Paid for by Legal Alert Line. Hello, Americans. It's Uncle Sam here. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes to the IRS or state, don't worry. I've got important news that may help you negotiate a lower tax bill. In today's economy, the IRS has released a variety of new rules and is offering more flexible terms to help Americans looking to settle their IRS debt. If you apply today, we may be able to lift your wage garnishments and release a freeze on your bank assets or business. Our team of tax professionals can resolve your case and stop collection actions against you. Even if you've been audited or haven't filed a return in years, they can help. Call right now and find out if you qualify to settle your IRS debt for far less than what you owe. Pick up your phone right now and call us for a free $500 IRS tax review. Don't wait. Here's the number. Call right now. 800-950-2049. 800-950-2049. 800-950-2049. For the last time, that's 800-950-2049. If you are trying to quit drinking or doing too many drugs, listen to me. You don't know me and we'll never meet. I had a problem like you once. I drank and used to party a little too much till it got out of control and almost ruined my life. 
I realized I needed help to fix my problem before it totally destroyed me. If you've tried to fix your drinking and drug problem and you know you can't do it alone, you need to call the National Treatment Advisors. They'll immerse you into a 30-day program to replace your old habits with new habits and totally change your life. And if you have PPO, private health insurance, the entire program may be covered. Fix your problem right now before it gets any worse. Get clean. Call now and learn more. 800-957-6209. 800-957-6209. 800-957-6209. That's 800-957-6209. Hey everyone, Dave Jackson here, ESPN Rules Analyst on ESPN Hockey, and you're listening to the Sports Circus. Hey, you're, you're listening to the Sports Circus right here. And Sal and Zach and Bobby V are going to tell you another little story. Um, you know, we're talking about Ogden, Utah, 1968. Lasorda University is the name of the book. Zach Manassian is the author who was with Tommy for uh, 50 years of uh, his life. And Tommy's also. He was the clubhouse man. I was the uh, MVP big mouth center fielder. I was the number one draft choice on the team. And a lot of places we went, they didn't like guys who were the number one draft choice. The guys who were at the end of the bench and signed for 500 were looking at me and saying, geez, he signed for $30,000. He signed for more than that. Geez, oh my. And in this one particular case, we were playing a doubleheader up in Caldwell, Idaho, and there was a guy on the bench who was on my butt the entire time. Now, remember in the 60s, Things were different. It was, uh, you know, the, the the Jets were going to going to have a little fight in the corner. Anyway, fighting was part of the game. People liked to fight in those days because you didn't have guns, you didn't have knife. You just had your brawn and you had to go about it. And Tommy was an ex-boxer. And Tommy was legendary for the fights that he had in his professional career as a player. And uh, he liked his players to fight. And during this one particular game, I was uh, being chastised by a member of the other team for two straight games, nine innings, every inning. When I came up, ah, number one, my bud, you can't do this, you can't. And when I got on third base, he was yelling, well, finally, I wanted to go and fight the guy in the dugout. Tommy said, don't do it, you'll get thrown out of the game. So we waited. The game's over. The second game's over. We swept the doubleheader. We're going down into the dugout, and Tommy stops stops me and turns me around. And he says, hey, you still want that guy? And I said, I sure do. He said, stay right here. He runs over to their dugout. He gets the guy out of the dugout, takes their whole team out and stands them on the third baseline, takes our team, stands them on the third baseline, and have me and the guy go go to Duke's on the mound in front of the team and in front of the fans who hadn't left the stadium yet. That's okay, incredible. This little, this yes. Little town of <laughs> yes. Well, that's the kind of stuff that's how it should I be. After I through kicking the dump out of this guy, the police were on the field to break up the fight. We needed a police escort out of this little town in Idaho because of the brawl that, that Tommy created out on the field. It was spectacular. That's incredible. You have, I, the only way I can relate to this when I was a lot younger is that we were playing at this one high school. It was a high school game, and they were talking smack to us, whatever, while we were getting on the bus, getting ready to go back. We are like, okay, all right, so our windows were down. You can only bring them down about this far. And they start throwing stuff at the bus. I'm like, oh, so it's like that. Everybody got out. We had our bats. We're like, all right, it's on. Let's go. And I love that environment because it seems like today, I don't know, guys, it just seems like people are a little bit softer today, right? They, they don't know what it's like to stand up for themselves. 
and do something about something instead of, oh, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm, I'm telling mom. No, I'll see you in the parking lot when we're done, buddy. That's what I want to see. And frankly, I think a lot of people want to see that too. And even in baseball today, if somebody comes in and buzzes you right under the chin, so be it. Right, but now, oh, you can't even throw inside to a hitter anymore. That's why Otani's hitting out of his mind. You bust that guy up and in, man. That guy won't hit his weight, but because he gets those arms extended. Hey, sorry, that's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. But that guy, when he gets his arms extended, that's the end of it. But you can't throw anybody up and in anymore. I think that's ridiculous. What do you think, Bobby? From the coaching standpoint, from the managerial standpoint, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the difference between 1968 and today is is definitely different. Uh, you you had the right to to hit a guy in those days. The crazy thing is um, that's that is with a pitch. Um, you know, pitchers understood. You hit a guy and you hit him in his back. You hit a guy, you hit him in his leg, really hard. Throw it as hard as you want, and you hit him there. Today, when someone does do something up and in. Their control isn't good enough, and then it becomes a very dangerous situation. So <clears throat> I, I kind of get the fact that they don't, and uh, I, I totally disagree with you about Otani. I don't think you could throw anything that he wouldn't be great at. <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, listen, and I can say that because I'm a spectator. I don't know yeah. nothing. I don't know nothing about nothing, and I never saw anything. But what I do know is that dude, in my opinion— I don't see him getting around, pulling the hands in, and getting around on an inside pitch. I just don't see it. What do I know? I just haven't seen enough. I probably, his, his kryptonite really is a changeup blowing away off the plate. That's probably the only thing he can't do serious damage on, and I think he's learned to take it. So um, He, he yeah, opens look, up. Look yeah. for, the, number, the numbers will abound. I know, but he he opens up and, and and that hip flies open and he cannot hit that outside pitch. But you got to set him up with something inside. Well, you sound like a pitching coach. Good luck. I don't know nothing. That's hey, listen. That's why I'm doing this, and I'm certainly not out there doing that because I don't know nothing and I've never done anything. So none of that stuff matters. Back to Lasorda University. I know Bobby, you've got just a few minutes left here. Give me one more story before you got to go. Well, you know, because we were always together, um, you know, th there was uh, like a fraternal feeling on this team. Uh, you know, when we weren't practicing, and, and Zach mentioned this, but I want to emphasize it, Tommy had no coaches. So batting practice was thrown by Tommy Lasorda to everyone on the team. Tommy Lasorda coached third base because there were no coaches on the team. Tommy taught me how to, how to run after a fly ball in the outfield, taught me how to bunt for a base hit, taught me how to hit the high ball, and taught me how to play shortstop later when I was in AAA. And he was a left-handed pitcher when he played. But he taught the entire game. And then what he would like to do is have fun with the guy. Because practice was work. And it was work the entire time. But one of his fun things was to go bowling. Where the guy, Tommy would get out in the, that old bowling uh, alley and he'd get a teammate and it would be competition. It would be blood and guts, yelling, screaming at the other guy. And, uh, you know, Tommy Pachura, who I mentioned, and, and others had, had just great matches. I didn't bowl for some reason. I don't know why I, I never got into that. But I used to watch them do it and just crack up with, you know, 15 of the players going one-on-one. -on -one. Zach, did, did you ever bowl? I did never. I never did bowl. I, I, I like you, went and watched a lot, but but never bowled. But they were a uh, great story about that was when Wimpy hit a triple and slid into third base and collided with the third baseman. Tommy was coaching third, and Wimpy was laying on the ground, and he didn't pop right up. Tommy got worried, and he ran over to Wimpy laying on the ground. Wimpy, Wimpy, you all right? You okay? Wimpy looked up, laying on the ground, holding his wrist. He said, yeah, yeah, I think I'm okay. And Tommy said, thank God. I thought that was your bowling hand. <laughs> so he was, he, he wanted to make sure Wimpy was healthy for the next bowling match. Wimpy Tom Pachorik, who played 20 years in the major leagues, broadcasted, as you know, Sal, 
for over 20 years for the White Sox and other teams and is still doing well in beautiful Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, Tommy gave Wimpy the name Wimpy because he never saw anyone eat as many hamburgers right. as Wimpy did. But, you know, hamburgers again. Hell, I think we had White Castle at 13 cents a burger. Yes. You know, so you can get a dollar's <laughs> worth and, and, and show up with a few burgers. <laughs> yes, you could. And, you know, White Castle is still around. But now White Castles are like $1.59, believe it or not. I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable. They uh, they deserve an astounding round of boos. Because, come on, these things are still the same damn size. They're the same size, but now they're charging a buck and a half for one? That's ridiculous. It's pretty amazing. Things have changed. It's amazing. Yeah. All right, any final words for you, Bobby, before you head out? Anyone maybe you want to say hello to or you want to, hey, follow me here or there? No, you know, you don't have to follow me. I do do some uh, pre and post for the Angels uh, on television on Valley West. And I happen to have a, be- a book out, too, called Valentine's Way, if anybody will ever want to pick that up. But the, the book we're talking about today. Here it, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Oh, yeah, that's Valentine's, Valentine's Way. Way. <laughs> hey, all hey, right. Thanks, you, you know what, Bobby? You're going to have to send me a copy of that. in here. Or maybe I'll get a copy if I if I see you. Give me a copy of that, then I can showcase it on air for you. We'll have to get you a copy, Sal. Yeah. You, you want it in English or in Japanese? Uh, all of the above, because I know you're a championship <laughs> manager over in Japan too, right? Right. I think that was what 2005, thereabouts. That a boy. Th- thank you very much. It was 2005. <clears throat> yeah. Well, all all I've got to say is, you know, life should be as uh, much fun as it was. When we were with, with uh, Zach Manassi and Tommy Lasorda in Ogden, Utah, back in 1968, but to relive some of the the wonderful times that people had, some of the great stories that they were able to tell, it's, the book is told by all the players on the team, and Zach did a fabulous job of of uh, putting that all together, and and he's a pretty damn good writer, also. So. Uh, enjoy yourself, Sal. A pleasure being here. I'll find you when you come down to Anaheim. I'll hand you a book. Uh, looking forward to it. Thanks for letting uh, Zach and I share our, our memories of Lestorda University yes, back sir. in 1968. Anytime, boss. We will see you soon. And, Zach, we're going to continue on when we come back here from break here on the Sports Circus. Lots more to come, folks. Don't go anywhere. The stories will continue, and we'll continue to talk about Lasorda University with Zach Manassian. Don't go anywhere. Ah, Tim Beach Point of the old ballpark, friends. Hi, pop fly. That one be a home run in a phone booth. I don't know what the big deal about Cracker Jack is. Did you ever go and buy a pack of Cracker Jack thinking you'd get a prize and find no prize <laughs> in the box? Here's the pitch. That might not sound important to some people, but when, you, when you're a little kid, especially from a humble origin, and they cheat you out of a prize, there's a bouncing ball. Second baseman has a Barbary over the first. It's hard to think in laudatory terms of the product. I Too think if there was an occasional box of Cracker Jacks that found no prizes for uh, the, the, the for the little Harry Carey many years ago. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> and boy, when a box of Cracker Jack to me meant a lot of money. Here's a pitch bounce foul. That's the most asinine marketing I've ever heard of. One ball, one strike. These guys say, well, you, you sing about Cracker Jack. I said that I only sing it because it's in the song. Here's a pitch foul back. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised, even to this day, some youngsters who buy a box of Cracker Jack don't find a prize in the box. One ball, two strikes, two out. Well, if you're going to talk about our congressman being crooked, here's a pitch foul out of play. Why not talk about commercial products that don't do what they represent to do?
They told me when they hired me it was a temporary job. Born and raised in St. Louis, and you can imagine the, the Cardinals were my favorite team from the day I could remember. And all of a sudden, the miracle of life, I'm broadcasting card games. I own the town. I've broadcast them for 25 years, and I thought they are going to give me a gold watch, and they gave me a pink slip. Then I went out to work for Charlie Finley for a year, and that's far for the course. Came to Chicago, and I was with the White Sox uh, 11 years, and I was the Cubs. Never missed a game, never missed a time at bat, never missed a half inning that I was supposed to do. You know, Chicago is such a marvelous city. Hey, we got some Chicago people. You know, uh, you never succeed in this business until you've had the experience of working with a terrible hangover. <laughs> Not until you've been able to come through with flying colors under those circumstances can you consider yourself a professional. Lord knows I've had more than my share of hangover. There's a drive. Way back. It might be. It could be. And it is. Holy cow. This crowd is wild. Welcome back to the sports circuit. I'm Al Bubba Baker, quarterback breaker and the rib maker. Welcome back to the Sports Circus. I'm your ringmaster, Sal, live from Las Vegas in the AMP TV studio, AAMP.TV. Folks, make sure to check out thesportscircus.com for upcoming guests, a prior guest, or recorded shows, which are a podcast. They can be found on all podcast platform. Also, make sure you check out the partners page. And one of those partners happens to be Lasorda University. In fact, you can find a picture of that book right there. You can click on it. And you can pick up that book from the local retailer. And here to tell you all about that wonderful book with great stories is the writer. That would be Zach Manassian. Sal, great to be back. Um, yeah, I would I would recommend the book to, to anyone out there that's a baseball fan, that's a Tommy Lasorda fan, uh, that has an interest in minor league baseball because it's it's about a specific minor league team back in 1968, uh, a team that included quite a few future major league players. Steve Garvey, Tom Pachorek, Bobby Valentine, um, uh, Billy Buckner. Uh, we had quite a good team that year. Uh, and this book chronicles that season. And it, uh, most of all, chronicles the great Tommy Lasorda, who, in my opinion, was the greatest motivator of, of young people that, that I've ever seen. And uh, earlier in the segment, we talked about fighting and how it was a part of the game. Uh, which is kind of a lost art now. You don't see it much. Once in a while, you'll see the benches empty. But uh, back then, it was a regular occurrence for the Ogden Dodgers. And uh, uh, Tommy fought as a player. But I think as a manager, he used fighting as a motivational tour. Uh, you know, it was like it, it was it was something that that he felt brought his team together as a team. You play together, you fight together, you're going to win together. And, and so fighting was definitely in his repertoire. And, uh, and really, it was meant to motivate his guys. And I, from what I saw, it really worked. And I remember him telling Peter O'Malley, who at the time was the minor league director <laughs> and Walter O'Malley's son, and Peter had called questioning why we're, we were fighting so much. And he said, Tommy, what's going on? And Tommy's simple answer was, we lead, uh, we lead the league in runs, hits, and police escorts. So <laughs> we were getting escorted out of, out of road cities regularly because of our fighting. But uh, it all worked, and uh, we went on to uh, be, be the league champions. So Tommy was an amazing guy. I think the book, Lasorda University, uh, will explain that very well. 
Well, you know, that's one of the things that people seem to forget over from earlier days to current days. There are so many layers of media and crap, but it's almost as if it seems to me, and I can't confirm it, it seems to me as players and certain people involved with baseball operations, whatnot, they're so worried about what happens on social media versus what really happens with the team off the field, off out of the clubhouse. What happens with the team? Is it just money, money, money? Or is there any team unity? And I love the stories about the bowling and the even the buffet and whatnot. The reality is it was really a family environment. You were a family at that point. And let's face it, if you had brothers, chances are you fought with your brothers. Well, if you have teammates, you're going to fight with your teammates, but you're also going to fight for them too because no one's going to push your teammates around, right or wrong. Uh, you're absolutely right. That was, you know, that was a big thing that held the team uh, together. Uh, it's not like that today. Um, I t- I'll tell you, you've got to build a team, Sal, and it's got to be, you know, 25 guys pulling together, meshing together. And I, I, use a, I use an example. We had Alex Rodriguez in Texas, and he came in 2001, I believe it was, and everybody was looking forward, obviously, to that great talent joining our team. Uh, he hit 52 home runs that year. He was the MVP. And where did the Rangers finish? Last. So uh, to me... Um, you know, it's not about one player. Uh, it's not about Otani or Mike Trout or whoever. Right. Uh, it's about finding a mix of players that are a going to stay healthy, but B are going to like each other. They're going to play for each other. They're going to want to watch each other's back. And when you accomplish that, now you've got a team. And I think, I think that's the difference. You know, uh, today they try to build the team by signing these unbelievably long-term big money deals with one guy. What about the other 24 guys? Right. You know, so it, it's to me, um, it's the biggest change in the game. You know what I saw back in my brief playing career is you know, I played here in the States and I also played in Mexico, played Mexican League ball. And I can tell you that the the game, the Mexican League baseball, to me, it was almost like going back and playing Little League with the fun environment. I mean, the talent was great. But what I'm saying is the family environment. It was a sure. more inclusive environment. And it wasn't yep. about this guy got paid, this guy got paid. No, we're all teammates. And I'll never forget this. So I, I wore number 11 on my jersey back then. And... There was another left-handed pitcher. I can't remember his name. And he had just taken one of the jerseys that was, it was still on the truck, <laughs> right, I'm from things being delivered over. And they, they just brought this guy into the team, and he was a pretty good pitcher, but it was a jersey that, that it had my name on the back of it, but there was no number on it, right? And the, so what we did, I mean, how crazy is this? Well, I didn't do it, but what the, the equipment manager did was, since I was number 11, they took a piece of duct tape and put a number one on his back. It was a great jersey, so it was a great piece of duct tape. And so he was out there. He could play, and I said, I don't care. It has my name on it, but it doesn't matter. It just makes sure the number is different. That's the only thing that really mattered, right? And so right. that was really from the official scorer. That's what they really wanted, right? Because there could have been right. a misprint. Right. The point is... The ball caliber, the environment caliber was exactly what we had just discussed. And I loved the environment versus playing stateside. It was me, 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 look at me, look at me. I got a big contract kind of stuff. Right. It was a prima donna donna show, and I couldn't stand that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I think that was what the minor leagues were like back then in 68 and in the 70s mm-hmm. that atmosphere was what it was like and the reason it was like that it's not because you were giving all those minor minor league players everything because you weren't you used all the good things that they would get later as they moved up right. as incentives but now you're getting 
what triple a players would get down in a ball and so that feel of entitlement that feeling you have of entitlement and that feeling of of of, of, i'm here and i'm great and you know there there is no motivation uh to move up the ladder and i think that's a big problem in the game um particularly in the major leagues now because now the salary the the average salary is a few million dollars so What, what, you know, money isn't, you know, money's what motivates them now. It's not, hey, if I go to double A, I'm going to, you know, be one step closer right. to big leagues. Or if I get to triple A, I'll be a, a, a heartbeat away. It's not that anymore. It's if they're getting money, they're happy. And so that to me is the difference in the game. Yeah, I think you're right. And honestly, I think there's a lot that has been lost in the last 40, 50 years, we'll say anywhere from 50 to all the way to today. There's so much that has been lost in that journey. You know, there's that old ACDC song, there's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. Well, it's a long way to the top if you want to play in the show, right? And those steps along the way, I don't care what level you're playing, the reality is you're one step closer, one step closer. But now social media says you don't have to be. And the money means... You don't have to be because now there's endorsement deals left, right, and center. Sure. Instead of getting right. paid a few hundred dollars a month, now they're getting paid yep. mad money. It's it's ridiculous. Right. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, uh, uh, your own bats used to be a major thing. I mean, and, you know, you couldn't get your own bat in a ball. Uh, you know, you and if you go to double A, you were a step closer to maybe, you know, Louisville coming and maybe considering you. Uh, to take you on as a client, certainly by AAA, if you were talented, they would approach you then. So there was always those those carrots along the way right. that were going to be but offered you earn to you. Those. I mean, Zach, you earn those. Now you're that yeah. much closer to a personalized glove. You're that much closer right. to a personalized baseball bat by Louisville Slugger or whomever. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly, and that's gone now, Sal. It's it's gone now, and and. Um, you know, I, I used to, as an equipment guy, I used to express that to the rookie players. And I know a lot of them took exception to it. And they may have even thought that I was picking on them because they were young guys, which is exactly the opposite of what I was trying to do. I was trying to teach them that as you go along with service time, you're going to get more and more and more you know, as you move up and, and, you know, they felt like they were being picked on. And so I just, I I could never quite understand that, but that's, that was what was happening. Yeah. You know, and and a final word before we go, look, it's the same thing of playing in the show. You get to play with that baseball that says major league baseball, not Pacific coast league or this league. No, it says major league. When you look at that, you're like, Wow. I'm really here. Yeah. Yes, I caught that ball. This is it. Yeah. All right, take 30 seconds, talk about the book, and then we're out of here. Well, again, I would cur- I would encourage all your listeners to give it a shot. It's available on Amazon. Uh, you can go to LasortaUniversity.com, which will also give you ordering options. Uh, there's an option there to get an autographed copy if you would like. So uh, I would encourage everybody it's a good, feel-good, clean book. Uh, no, no dirty stories, no gossip. Uh, just a lot of fun things that went on uh, with a lot of great young men. Uh, and as Bobby mentioned, a lot of those guys didn't last. I mean, it was three months, and they were released, and they went home, and their baseball careers were over. And so I think this book is a testament to them uh, and their three months in the sun and their three months with the great Tommy Lasorda. Hey, that's great stuff. All right, well, Zach, always a pleasure. You're always welcome on the show anytime you want. Next time, bring bring Wimpy back. We've already had Garvey on, but we'll have to ask Steve about some of the stories, too. Oh, okay, I'd love to do that. Wimpy would entertain for an hour, I'll tell you. He's the best. That's great stuff. All right, folks, we're going to be back here in about 23 hours right here on your favorite station. So until then, so long, everyone.
can your IRA stand up to the next financial crisis that our top economists are saying is at our doorsteps? By allocating a percentage of your IRA into physical gold and silver with a tax-free rollover, you can diversify and safeguard your holdings from turbulent markets and economic downturns by putting your IRA back on the gold standard. Find out how to safeguard your assets with a tax-free rollover with a Genesis Gold IRA. The only IRA that can hold physical precious metals. Call now for your free gold and silver report. Protect your IRA today with one simple phone call and learn how to qualify for up to $10,000 in free silver. Call Genesis Gold Group, empowering faith-driven stewardship. 800-932-5517. 800-932-5517. 800-932-5517. That's 800-932-5517. 